Today's Gospel reading is from the 20th chapter of John, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. As she wept, she bent over looking into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of Scripture. Amen. As we turn now to our message We have just completed a Lent of affirming a faith in which we are blessed regardless and where we can lean into embracing our good enough lives. And as we celebrate Easter today, we celebrate a faith that is victorious despite our mundane, difficult lives. As we open our hearts to receive God's word for us this day, I I ask you to take a moment to pray with me. Let's pray together. Lord God, we come to you this morning on this festival Easter day, asking for your presence and your power. Speak to us, speak into our hearts and our lives and our souls that we might know the true power of resurrection and true life in you. We are coming to listen, so speak to us now we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So awe-inspiring, amazing, absolutely brilliant unfathomable, inconceivable, unbelievable. Hallelujah. This, friends, is the day of all days. This is a day of new beginnings. This is the feast of Easter, the day of resurrection, the victory of all victories. We gather on this day to celebrate the most profound and momentous occasion in all of world and human history. Because you see, on that day, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus walked out of the tomb, he rewrote the course of the universe. Jesus conquered sin and death and gave you and I the promise of eternal life with him. No more 
No more will people die because of their sins. No more would suffering and pain be in vain. No more would people have to view death with fear and trembling as the finality of everything they had hoped for and loved. Yes, when Jesus rose, he brought true life to all, the first fruits of a harvest that we will all feast upon. And so we shout and we sing hallelujah this day because Christ the Lord is risen. Will you say hallelujah with me? Hallelujah. Amen. We celebrate Easter resurrection and the joy and the power that that brings. And yet, but we have to sort of say, but now what? Now what? We recognize the victory, the final outcome of life everlasting with Christ but we're still here. We still live in a fallen world full of evil and suffering and pain. See, Easter is tricky when it comes to faith. Yes, we come for the joyful ending, the, and they lived happily ever after. The resurrection story proclaims hope over despair and life over death. Yet, we know that life continues for us as a story of often spiking heartbreak, moments that are not forever fixed. During our season of Lent and over this past week of Holy Week, we have been focused on growing gardens, tending the life that is right in front of us, rather than trying to constantly climb ladders of what this world defines as success. In other words, we've been embracing good enough lives and good enough selves that are worthy of love no matter what. We've been acknowledging that the suffering that is a natural part of life, and we have practiced compassion as we deal with the realities and limitations that invite us to let go of perfectionism and the incessant drive towards something other than our own real, holy and blessed regardless lives. And now we encounter Easter. It's a day we proclaim again that while death is a part of life, even little deaths along the way, deaths of dreams, of love, of the way we thought life would go, even though this is part of life, we are part of a faith that invites us to consider that the good gardener is always tending us, abiding with us, beyond any kind of death that faces us. And so I want to think a moment about that gardener, that master gardener who works with us. Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie in their book and devotional, Good Enough, write this about a good gardener. They say, gardening requires a certain kind of hope, envisioning a new life in the midst of despair and death. Gardeners, of course, toil and trowel, they pluck and they prune, all for a single bloom. The very act of gardening is one of hope, and it's the exact kind of hope that a woman was hunting for that very first Easter morning. If we recall the story that we just heard in our gospel lesson, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And so she ran off to find Peter and John and the other disciples and let them know that that the tomb was open. and, and And she said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've laid him. After Peter and John ran to the tomb and verified that indeed it was empty, they then returned home, not sure what to think. But Mary lingered there in the garden where the tomb was located. And she was distraught that someone would desecrate the body of Jesus and humiliate him even further. As again, Kate Bowler writes, Mary peers inside that tomb again. And it's then that she encounters angels sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying. And the angels said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And Mary, of course, responds, well, they've taken away my Lord, and and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around. And I love, again, how Kate Bowler and Jessica uh, Ritchie explain this. They say, 
Then turning to leave from seeing the angels, she nearly bumps into a man with dirt under his fingernails. And he too asks her, why are you crying? And through her tear-blurred eyes, she mistakes him for the gardener. And she begs him to tell her where Jesus' body lies. What a strange detail, they write. The resurrected Christ is mistaken for a gardener. Maybe it's because he stole the gardener's clothes since he was stripped. his clothes were stripped and, and gambled over. Maybe it's because he carries the pruning shears of a vine dresser, the careful tender of our souls, ready to pluck and plant, uproot and cut back. Maybe he looks ready to cultivate new life, to pull us toward resurrection with his fingers digging in among the worms. Or maybe this gardener looks like he knows something about hope, hope that Mary desperately needs, we all desperately need. You see, a good gardener knows the kind of hope it takes to sow a seed in the ground, to cover it with manure, to bury it in the cold winter dirt surrounded by naked trees, and then to leave it be for months, trusting that with the magic amount of water and air and time, something new will be born out of a single seed. You see, the first step to creating life from this insignificant genetic package, you must bury it. A seed reaches its, po its potential only when it's buried. And when things look most lost, most dark, most covered, most long gone, most hopeless, that is when the seed is undergoing the most important change. Through its death, it might produce much fruit. This gardener knows the hope it takes to believe that through the death, through the freezing, through the fire, through the floods, through the darkness, through the crushing, through the consumption, through the waiting, even there, new life can be born. Now, Mary doesn't recognize that the gardener is Jesus, not until he finally calls her by name, Mary. And then she recognizes, Rabboni, teacher, it's my Lord. But it's like a gardener who can name every variation of plant growing in his plot. Jesus knows all of our names and calls us each by name. Maybe this is what it means to be an Easter person, to see Christ and think gardener, even master gardener, not as a mistaken identity, but as a prophetic one. The seed in the ground, the body in the tomb. This is a picture of defiant hope. All of the labor and sweat and love and precious time given for a single bloom, delicate and bold, brief but memorable. Hallelujah, indeed. So friends, we live in a garden tended by the master gardener. But the garden restoration is not fully complete yet, right? The kingdom of God has been inaugurated by Jesus. Jesus said the kingdom of God is at hand and the kingdom of God is within you. But it is yet to be fulfilled. So you and I, we, we live in this in-between time where the kingdom has started, but it's not fully here. It's what we call the secular times. And we are still waiting for that final chapter to be written when God's will is truly done on earth as it is in heaven, when love wins and when we can experience that love without limits. In the meantime, in the meantime, our nature of being created for love is that we will always hunger for more and there's never enough life and love to satisfy us. And to be honest, endings are often way too soon. But perhaps, perhaps a good enough faith is one that moves through the chronic nature of being incurably human with all of our frailties with an eye for resurrection moments that assure us that this good enough life 
is truly worthy of our amazement. So my prayer for you, friends, is that you may go forth on this Easter Sunday reminded that you are loved, you are forgiven, you are set free to live as God created you to be, and that is truly good enough. Amen and amen.